Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The Word of God that's going to serve as the basis for our message and meditation this morning comes from Luke chapter 23, as we see the first of Jesus' seven words spoken from the cross. I will be reading that portion of Scripture in just a moment, but I do want to direct your attention also to the listening guide insert. This was available to you as a paper insert in your worship folder this morning. It's also available to you in our app, so if you'd like to fill it in on the app, Uh, you are welcome to do so. It's available there in the app under Connect and Worship. You'll find the sermon notes and this set of sermon notes, the -the fill-in-the-blank outline of the main points that we'll be making, as well as some further thought questions to help you take this message deeper into your lives. As I said, our meditation is going to focus on these words from Luke chapter 23. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. Soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. This is the gospel of of our Lord. At the age of 90, Winston Churchill said, I'm bored with it all. And then he slipped into a coma, and nine days later, he died. Those were his famous last words. Famous last words are those words that people speak right near the moment of their death and they become immortalized, maybe because they're witty or clever, maybe they're profound or prescient. Sometimes the famous last words, they're spoken by people who had absolutely no idea that death was near in their life. And sometimes they're spoken by people who certainly knew that death was knocking on their door. And so they spoke them deliberately and with a plan and for a purpose. Sometimes those last words were filled with very dark, twisted humor. A man by the name of James French, he was a convicted murderer. He was actually the last person that the state of Oklahoma put to death using the capital punishment, death penalty. And as he was led to the execution chamber where he was going to be electrocuted, he shouted out to the members of the press who had gathered to witness his execution, and he said, How's this for your headline? French fries. Sometimes the humor was a little more lighthearted than that. Sometimes last words are spoken with anger and animosity. The actress Joan Crawford, she shouted out at her housekeeper, who while Joan was dying was praying for her, and she shouted out to her, Don't you dare ask God to help me. And you can Google famous last words and You can come up with all kinds of results, thousands of them really, but we also know that there are also countless thousands, maybe even millions of people who have spoken last words that were not immortalized, they were not written down, they were not remembered. But today we begin to look at the last words, the famous last words that come from the lips of a man named Jesus. 
as he was dying on the cross. And Jesus certainly knew that death was near. And so he was deliberate in his delivery of his last words. He planned those last words, not to be witty or clever, but certainly profound. He didn't speak those last words in anger or animosity, but rather in mercy and love. And as he spoke those last words, they were not uttered without meaning or impact. But his last words, the famous last words of Jesus, they were well-planned, well-spoken, and life-changing. Jesus proclaimed his last words from the cross to change your very life. And so today, as we turn and as we hear the first of these last words from Jesus, really the first of seven words or sayings that Jesus spoke while he was on the cross, we turn to the gospel writer Luke, and he's going to set the scene for us. Now remember that this took place after Jesus had endured an an all-night-long secret trial where the Jewish leaders, the chief priests, they had sought to condemn him. They finally got a false charge to stick against him so that they could condemn him. And then they led him to Pilate, where they pressured Pilate, the Roman governor, to also condemn and convict this man and send him off to be executed by crucifixion. And so then we hear as the gospel writer Luke lays out that scene and the context that surrounded these words. He says, Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals. One on his right, the other on his left. And this really reminds us that this was all Part of God's plan. This was all according to the will and the plan that God had from the beginning. A plan that he had shared many years earlier, sometimes thousands of years, sometimes hundreds of years, as he prophesied what would happen to his chosen one. And so these words of Jesus, this context that we see, it fulfilled prophecy. And throughout this season of Lent, as we take a look at these last words from Jesus, we're going to see over and over and over again how Jesus on the cross fulfilled prophecies that God had spoken hundreds and thousands of years before. This one in particular fulfills a prophecy God shared through his servant Isaiah. In Isaiah 53, God said this. He said, Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus was numbered among the transgressors, criminals in the language of Luke. Robbers, thieves, murderers, insurrectionists, those who had led and incited mobs and violence, extremists, terrorists. We don't, we don't know exactly what crimes they were convicted of. But we do know that these men were bad men. They were evil. They were wicked. They were hardened criminals. They were men of whom the Roman government wanted to make examples. And so they hoisted them up on these trees to die in the sight of all the people. And such hardened, wicked men often would go down swinging. Can you imagine some of the last final actions 
and final words of these hardened criminals as they were hoisted up to their death? Can you sense the the seething rage that slipped through their lips at those who crucified them? Can you imagine the dark and twisted comic quips that they would have spoken? And yet, Jesus was numbered among them. Jesus was numbered among these transgressors, even though he was righteous and innocent and holy, he too was hoisted up on the tree to die. And it's in this grim and gruesome context of death that we hear Jesus' first famous last words. Father Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Can we even wrap our minds around what Jesus says? Father, forgive them as he pleads for God's mercy and and divine compassion and forgiveness to be poured out upon the very ones who mocked him beat him, drove those iron spikes into his wrists and his ankles, lifted him up on this tree to die. Can we possibly imagine how Jesus could ask for forgiveness? For those who stripped him of his clothing to humiliate him in nakedness? Those who had earlier dressed him up to mock him, who had crushed a crown of thorns into his skull, who repeatedly struck him in the face with their fists, who even spit on him. Father, forgive them. Undoubtedly, the mercy and compassion of Jesus is incredible. And who is the object of this impassioned plea? Who's the them here? I mean, don't don't you wonder that, especially when you hear that follow-up phrase where it says, for they do not know what they are doing? If if the them is the Jewish leaders and the chief priests and, and the people, well, they certainly knew what they had done, They wanted to convict and eliminate this man who threatened them, threatened to take away their power and their hold on the Jewish people, even as he claimed to be God's Christ, the chosen one who was coming to save them. And so perhaps, yes, perhaps they did not know what they were doing. Because if they had accepted Jesus' claims, if they had trusted in what he had said and knew that he was the Christ, well, they certainly would not have crucified him. Maybe Jesus had in mind those Roman soldiers. And they too, they knew what they were doing to the extent that it was their unfortunate orders that day to crucify the convicted and condemned criminals. Maybe they saw it as a political victory because Jesus had been portrayed as a rebel. He had been portrayed as this self-anointed king who opposed the throne of Rome. And and so maybe they saw some patriotism in their actions. But maybe they also could claim ignorance that they did not know what they were doing because they did not comprehend and understand the religious and spiritual significance of Jesus as the divine sovereign ruler over this entire world. And Jesus, he did not excuse their actions because of ignorance, but rather Jesus and his last words here, they demonstrate his incredible mercy and compassion. A mercy and compassion that Jesus has also shown to you. 
Because sometimes we don't know what we are doing either. No, we don't know what we are doing when we choose evil over good. When we choose immorality over morality. When we choose sin over godliness. We don't really know what we are doing. We cannot possibly fathom the implications of those actions, the horrible consequences that ensue because of those choices. We can't possibly understand how far away from our God they separate us, how they take us away from a place of light and joy because of such a choice. We can't possibly understand what those choices truly mean in our life. And if we did, if we truly understood how far away from God we pushed ourselves in our choice to rebel, our choice to disobey, because we do understand that, right? We understand when we disobey. We understand when we choose our own will and our selfish desires instead of God's will, we understand when we choose to please ourselves rather than honor, respect, and revere our divine creator. We do understand that, but if we truly understood what that meant, the horrible ramifications of it, then our mind and our reason, wouldn't it convince us not to make that choice? Now, sometimes we don't understand what we are doing. But we do understand how much we need God's mercy and forgiveness. Which is exactly why Jesus was there on that cross. You see, there's a greater truth and a greater fulfillment in that prophecy that I talked about earlier from Isaiah 53. Jesus was numbered among the transgressors because he was numbered among you and me. We too are the transgressors. And so Jesus, he stood among us in our place. Maybe you have never played a part in a coup or an insurrection, but you have often thrown off the authority of your God. You have rebelled against him. You have rather grabbed control and autonomy for yourself instead of showing the glory and the worship due your God. You have become hardened in your own sins. And so Jesus' words, and through his words, he met the greatest need for humanity. The need for forgiveness. The need that you and I, we share. Jesus met that greatest need as he prayed this prayer to God, his heavenly Father. Because Jesus was there on that cross to make the answer to his prayer possible. He was there on that cross so that God could justly forgive sins. Do you see how Jesus' prayer, Father, forgive them, it's really a prayer that his crucifixion would continue? Because Jesus knew that not only did he need to, to suffer physically, but he also needed to suffer emotionally and spiritually. The wrath of God poured out against sin so that God could justly forgive us. And so God's divine justice was levied against Jesus there on the cross so that he might forgive through this act of moral injustice, that God's divine justice might take place. Jesus was there to win our forgiveness. As his crucifixion continued, the chief priests and the leaders, they said this, they mocked him with these words. He said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Christ the chosen one. And these words of Jesus, 
Father, forgive them. They answer that challenge far better than a powerful and miraculous escape from the cross would have. Because this was God's plan. This was what the Christ was supposed to do. This is what he was sent for to enable forgiveness, to bring about the forgiveness of all people through his sacrificial death on the cross. Now, we don't understand how far from God we have gone. We don't understand how desperately we need him. We don't understand our fate and destiny apart from Jesus, but we can understand his incredible forgiveness. And we can rejoice in that forgiveness. To rejoice in the forgiveness that Jesus has won for us, that is the greatest takeaway to have from his words from the cross. But there's also instruction here. Jesus modeled for us what he taught us. Because Jesus is the one who taught us, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus is the one who who taught us to pray, forgive our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Jesus was the one who, who taught us that we forgive someone not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times, 70 times, or, or 700 times, or as many times that we lose track and we don't keep count, but we just keep forgiving. Do you find forgiveness hard? Now, sometimes I think it is challenging to forgive another person, especially if they've done something deliberate, meditated, planned to hurt us. How many of you at some point this week were without power or water or heat in your home? I think that's just about everybody and every family that's sitting here, right? Now, what if you found out? I mean, right now, many people in our state, they are pretty angry, pretty upset at their energy company or the managers or government officials. But what if you found out that somebody deliberately shut off your power? Deliberately took away your heat and your water. Made you miserable for those days on purpose. Could you forgive them? Do you struggle to forgive someone who has betrayed you? A spouse? Maybe a family member, a friend? Do you struggle to forgive the racism and the bigotry that you've experienced in your life? Do you struggle to forgive the the bullies that you've come up against in school? Can you make this your prayer? Father, forgive them. Can you draw strength and encouragement from what you see and experience in Jesus on the cross and his incredible forgiveness. He prayed for forgiveness for his enemies. He prayed for forgiveness for those who mocked and beat him. He prayed for forgiveness for you and me. He prayed that God's mercy would wash over you and cleanse you of all of your sins. Allow Jesus' mercy to move you to mercy too. Allow Jesus' forgiveness to move you to forgive. This prayer, Father, forgive them, it is a prayer that is sorely missing in our world right now. And you have the opportunity to bring it. You have the opportunity to pray it, the opportunity to speak it, the opportunity to live it out as you sow mercy and you forgive. Jesus' famous last words, they are full of meaning for our lives. They fulfilled prophecy. They demonstrated his mercy and compassion. 
They met our greatest need for forgiveness. They answered the challenge of whether he was the Christ. And they model forgiveness for us. Amen.